The media are the ones that are making him the prime suspect. We are not. We have uh, quite a few people uh, that look very good. And it's surprising. You know, you get onto one person, and you, people tend to make their suspect fit uh, all the aspects of Ted. But we work on, we can't work on one at a time. We've got quite a few at a time. And they all look just right down the line until we finally find, come to a point where they're totally eliminated. In the early days of Ted Bundy, many of his first victims, he was stalking, planning, and taking his time. He was at home, in his own backyard. He knew the main roads, the back alleys, the passes through the mountains. And with each every other victim he took, things became even more grotesque for him. His hunger grew, his desires grew, and his impulse became even stronger. It turned against him. The life of a boyfriend a stepfather, a law student. These are elements that he would never have because Ted would say in his own words, he was controlled by this desire. This is the story of Ted in his hometown with his first murders that we know about, how he stalked, picked, and hid his victims. Ted's family and friends thought there's no way he's involved in any of these disappearances with these young women. People always thought Ted was innocent if they didn't know him from Adam, just by his looks, his family, his characteristics, his nature. You see this lady right here? Her name is Frances. She lived in the same house as Ted Bundy when he was on the run in Florida. The house was just two blocks from Florida State University. Just a week or so before Ted went on his last rampage, Ted and Frances went out on a date. When Frances was asked what they talked about, she said we just talked about everyday things and about how often Ted jogged around the university. That right there is how Ted went so long without being seen, noticed, that he had anything to do with murdering people. In the beginning, when you dig into the digging of how Ted started murdering people, you find detail and whispers, the sightings, and the victims' conversations to friends and family before they disappeared. There's very little confusion on how Ted became so good at taking women in the night or even in broad daylight. Ted would go unnoticed for so long while he was taking women. Nobody ever suspected him. Why would they? Ted even said, at a very young age, he was having urges of hurting women in a very sexual way. Things that aroused him, he knew weren't normal. It was alarming to himself, but it was a secret. A secret that he kept to himself. He knew it wasn't right. Ted said the first habit that he started was very simple. He just started following women. He did this for years. He found women and started following them. Following them to work, to school, to their boyfriends, to their home. He learned things about them. He then started sneaking around their home at night, looking in the windows, seeing where they slept, what time they went to bed, who they lived with. Ted was teaching himself how to track and stalk people, learning their habits. This is a very interesting stage in Ted's life. As far as we know, he has not murdered anybody. He simply is just learning and spending much time doing this. There's a very big element that is taking place in the very beginning before Ted starts abducting women. Along with the stalking, finding potential victims, Ted is a hiker and a camper. He spends large amounts of time in the woods. One of Ted's favorite places to hike is Taylor Mountain, but it just so happens that Taylor Mountain will be one of Ted's biggest dumping grounds for where he would take his victims, assault them, mutilate them, perform necrophilia, living out his fantasies. This is a very interesting stage in Ted's life. It's around 72, 73. He's just learning 
He's learning how to kidnap people. Sakura's thought, does he even know what he's going to become? Does he know what he's going to do? It's still in his head. He has not reacted on it. It's an unbelievable position to think of. There are many that believe Ted started murdering women very early on. But the ones that we do know about start in 1974. The first person that we know about that Ted attacked was in 1974, January 4th, the beginning of the year. It almost seems Ted was starting off the year saying, this is what I'm going to be doing. He literally started four days into the year. On that night, Karen Sparks would be in her home. She was only 18 years old. Ted never talked about this crime or how long he stalked Karen. But what we know is that Ted snuck his way in through the window of her bedroom that night, found Karen asleep, took a bedpost from her own bed and started beating her with it and other very grotesque things. But also, while she was unconscious, being knocked out, we don't know what else Ted did to her. Did he take pictures? Did he assault her more? As far as we know, this was the first time Ted was ever in a victim's room that he attacked. You can see in the pictures that Ted tears up the room looking for things, more than likely taking some souvenirs, things that he even might sell or keep. Ted obviously thought he had killed her, but luckily, by a miracle, Karen survived. He would leave Karen in her bed and leave the property. This is the first time that we know Ted has committed such a violent act. He's literally just beat Karen, almost mutilated her body. There's no rhyme or reason besides it's just hatred, anger. It doesn't make sense. It just seems Ted is mad, but it will be a horrifying clue to what's coming for the next 30 to 40, maybe even 50 women. Karen would lay in her bed of blood and pain for almost 20 hours before anybody found her. But Karen is alive and she has made a life and a family for herself. But she would be the first. Almost a month later, the 1st of February, 1974, in the same city, Seattle, Washington, Ted would pick the home of Linda Ann Healy. This is Ted's first murder that we know about. This would be different. It's obvious to say that this is just no accident. Ted had been watching Linda. He knew where she lived, where she slept, her habits, more than likely had been watching her the whole month, maybe even longer. But on the night of January 31st, Linda went out that night with a few friends, relaxing at a local beer tavern. It's never been talked about by Ted, but more than likely, Ted was in the tavern that night watching Linda. He probably followed her from her home. She may have even bumped into him that night. A split of a second conversation, excuse me, hi, Something she never even thought about again. We know that Ted did this. He met many of his victims the day of, earlier in the day, or weeks before he took them. When he was stalking and tracking them. More than likely, Ted wanted to take Linda at the bar that night. And he knew he couldn't show his face to her friends. Linda and her friends would return home around 10 p.m. that night, around 11.30, Linda would walk into one of her friend's rooms and have a conversation. She was happy, talking about life. Around 12 o'clock that night, Linda would go back downstairs to her bedroom and go to sleep for the last time. Ted's never talked about the murder. We really know nothing about the situation that took place. We can only speculate and guess from what we know Ted did to other victims and what evidence he left behind. It's sad to say, by the time Ted starts confessing of murders, Linda is so far down the list, she never really comes up in detail. But what we do know is that when Linda was in her bedroom, it was her place of safety, of refuge. She painted her walls not long before her death. She decorated her room the way she wanted it. When she went to bed, we know that she was in there alone. She fell asleep. More than likely, Ted waited till around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. He walked up the hill to Linda's window. 
peeked inside, seeing no movement and darkness. He could tell she was asleep. He had obviously been waiting for this moment. He had more than likely watched her nights before, but this night, he was going to take her. Ted would work his way into the house. When he opened the door on the side of the house, it would lead upstairs and downstairs. There's no question Ted knew there was other people in the house. He knew there was more women upstairs, but Ted is fresh. Ted is new at this. As far as we know, Ted has not actually murdered anybody yet, but he has picked Linda to be his first. He walks downstairs quietly into her room. He knows she's down there. Linda never hears Ted walking down. He walks up to her bed. Linda is inside of it, sound asleep, completely unaware what is going on. As Ted is standing over Linda, he will strike her in the head with an object. We can see blood stains on her pillow and her mattress where her head laid. There is also blood around her pelvis area. More than likely, Ted did the same thing he did to his last victim with an object. But what would be different with this night is that Ted is going to take Linda with him. But Ted did something before he took Linda. He changed her clothes. The clothes she had on, he took off and put them in the closet and put on her casual clothes. The only thing we can assume that why Ted did this, maybe it fits right into his head, the image of her he has where he needs her in casual clothes or that he was afraid of being pulled over and wanted Linda in regular clothes to maybe say his girlfriend was passed out drunk. Ted will pick up Linda, walk her out of her room, up the stairs, and out of the side door, walking outside, down the stairs, to his Volkswagen. He will place Linda in the passenger side of his vehicle and take her to what we know to be Taylor Mountain. At this point, Ted is fully addicted to stalking and murdering and having his victim's corpses nearby. Ted's next victim, the story of Donna Manson, has never really been publicly talked about because there's not much known, and what is known is terrifying. But she is Ted's third victim and second person to be murdered by him. We know fragments, bits and pieces of what happened or may have happened to Donna. On March 12, 1974, it was a Tuesday, Donna was going to a dancing class that evening, and then later that night, around 8 p.m., she was going to a jazz concert at her college, at the school she attended, Evergreen College. Donna's friends that she lived with said she changed outfits three times that night, that she was very worried about her appearance and wanted to look just right that night. Donna did not say anything to her roommates about meeting up with anybody, like having a date. For the second time, Donna left her dorm around 7 p.m., taking the walkways to the concert hall. It was no more than 200 yards away. The trails that led from the dorm to the concert hall were covered in woods and dark. When Donna left her room, she was never seen again. This is where many people have different speculations on what happened. Some people think she had a date that night, a date with Ted Bundy. Maybe she was keeping it secret because Ted was an older man and Donna was only 19. But many think Ted was walking the back trails at night and used one of his tricks on Donna, using crutches, a cast, dropping books, asking for help, and then striking her over the head with an object. What we do know about the murder is that Ted remembers taking a girl from Evergreen College, and he said he did not remember a lot of details other than the whole encounter was bizarre. It was a very out-of-body experience, he said, and nightmarish for him. More than not, grabbing clues from what Ted is saying, it did not go smooth, and Donna was putting up a fight and begging for her life. All that Ted would say that he could remember or wanted to talk about would end up in the Cascades, Taylor Mountain site. He said he buried her body somewhere different. He could not pinpoint, and Donna's head was not with her body. Sadly, out of Donna's story, another story would emerge. 
Ted claims that he took the head of Donna to the home of his girlfriend Liz and burned it in her fireplace to ash. Many do not believe this to be true due to the fact it takes extreme heat to burn a skull to ash and Ted said he did just that. But Ted is a liar and some think he may have said this just to get back at Liz because she cut all ties with him in the end while in prison and this was his way of getting back at her. Donna's body or head have never been found. It's now April and Ted's girlfriend Liz is very confused about his behavior. She says he's changing. He's spending more time away from her and her daughter. He's not talking about their future. He's more abrupt, canceling dates with them, being caught in lies, confessing to stealing things. On April 17th, a man was walking around Central Washington University with bandages and a cast, saying he needed help carrying his books or dropping them while having his hands full and unable to use them. This is one of the first times where Ted is spotted and his face is seen by witnesses. Two young women with dark hair and slim fit will both be approached by Ted, one early in the day and one later in the day. They will give different interviews, giving two different accounts with how the man looked and the story he was giving. We know from the encounters, Ted changed his clothes from early in the day to later in the day. From the two witnesses, he went from wearing a hat to not wearing a hat. Ted had been at the college all day approaching women, looking and trying to snag anyone he could with his story, wanting them to walk to his car to help him. This is where Susan Rancourt will walk into Ted Bundy's view, sadly. Susan does not fit the identification of Ted's other victims. She has blonde hair and is more of a curvature woman. She stands out among all of his victims, even from this point. Many people believe since it was late in the day and Ted had had no luck getting anyone else to come to his Volkswagen. He just started picking anybody. He became desperate and just wanted a person. Ted is obviously not able to lure his usual victim. But later in the same day, Susan took her clothes to be cleaned at the school laundromat. She then went to an advisory meeting. And while there, she told her friends she wanted to go back and watch a movie with them. But first, she had to go collect her clothes. When Susan leaves the advisory meeting, she is never seen again. It's around 9 p.m. that night. It was dark. Susan was walking outside from the advisory meeting building to walking to the laundromat. Somewhere in there, she ran into Ted Bundy. Ted either used his tricks on her to grab her attention, or just being so desperate, he stepped out of the shadows and took her. On March 3rd, 1975, Susan will be found on Taylor Mountain. Her skull will be found. It will have a large fracture indicating she was knocked unconscious. We really know no details of the kidnapping and murder of Susan. Ted does not talk about it. He simply just confesses that he did it a day before he is executed. It's safe to say that Susan and Ted never met before that night. There was no stalking. There was no watching. Ted simply just walked up on Susan. And that's all it took. Susan's family, to this day, is very outspoken about their daughter's death. When Susan first went missing, her mother and father and close family stayed in dorms and was fed by the college so they could look for Susan. But she would eventually be found on Taylor Mountain. Ted is using Taylor Mountain as a dumping ground for his bodies. There's a secret road there. It's called Powerline Road. As you pull slightly off the highway, you can see Ted would drive up the hill around the corner and back into the woods, following this very narrow dirt road. As you follow the red line, this is where Ted starts piling up bodies in the woods. But while Ted was still finding new victims, he would still visit the old victims, their remains, at this site. During the day, to not look suspicious, he would ride his bike 
up to Powerline Road, back and forth. Even while the victims' bodies are laying there, days, weeks, after being murdered, Ted is still not done with the process. He is performing necrophilia with the bodies. We know that Ted would spend time on top of Taylor Mountain. Ted even said at one point he had a Polaroid camera. He would take pictures of the victims before and after death, posing them in different ways he wanted. Another aspect that Ted talked about is that he removed the heads of all the women on Taylor Mountain. Some he would keep for a few days, taking back and forth to his apartment. Ted will even express to Hagmeyer that he would lay down with many of them. He would do this with the bodies as well, in the woods, until he could no longer stand the stench. This is a key thing that one needs to understand about Ted. He loves murdering, stalking, hunting, and taking life, but he also is obsessed with death, the smell of it, the look of it, its grotesque sound. On May 6, 1974, it was a Monday. This story would end up four hours away in Oregon to a young woman named Roberta Parks. She is 20. She is a student at Oregon State University. What we know is that Roberta, that she was having a very rough day. Her friend said that she was having relationship problems and taking it very hard. And on that same day, her father had a heart attack and would end up in the hospital. Roberta would be on the phone for most of the day with her family, mostly her sister. The sad part is, she had an argument with her father two days beforehand and never talked to him again. Later in the day, into that night, Roberta was walking home from her dorm to the commons area. She ran into a friend. Roberta's friend said they talked for a short time, mostly about a Spanish test that was coming up. Roberta told her friend she was on her way to get a hot fudge sundae. This is the last time she was seen. She simply just vanished after walking away from the conversation. Ted will talk very little, if any, about the Roberta case. So little in fact, we're not even sure if he remembers much of it. What we do know from the evidence and what Ted said is that he drove there that day, four hours away from his home, from Seattle to Oregon. Somewhere that night, he will run into Roberta, saying that he could tell she was emotional and upset. Somehow, he will lure her to his Volkswagen and knock her unconscious. Many think that Ted spent the day looking for a victim, this location being four hours away. No one around there knew what was going on, just four hours away in Seattle, that college women were disappearing. Ted was using this to his advantage. More than likely, he found Roberta upset and talked to her, and somehow gained her trust to go to his car. When her skull was found, the front of it was beaten so bad that it collapsed into itself. It will be found just eight months later. In just three weeks' time, a new story will arise, a new victim, and a story that is still complicated today. The story of Brenda Ball is covered in different stories and theories, but we will go off of what we know to be factual and what Ted spoke of. On May 31st, 1974, Ted had an extremely long day that would go into the night of June 1st. But on May 31st, that evening, Ted spent the day with his girlfriend Liz and her daughter and her two parents. He took them out for pizza. The dinner lasted for about an hour and a half. Liz, Ted's girlfriend, says he was rushing and trying to hurry everyone out. When Ted got everyone in the vehicle, and took them all back to Liz's house. Ted simply said good night and he was going home and going to bed. Liz found this strange that her boyfriend would take her home and just say goodbye. He said, I'll see you in the morning because Liz's daughter was being baptized the next morning on June 1st. After Ted drops off the whole family, he drives off. Just literally moments later, Ted is on the University of Washington in Seattle. He is there pulling his old tricks. Ted parks his Volkswagen outside of eternity. He props the hood up, stands over it with his arm in a cast. It's dark outside. 
As women go by, he grabs their attention and says he needs help. This is where Phyllis Armstrong will meet Ted Bundy. As she's walking by, Ted stops her and asks for her help. She will agree, in no way thinking, that this man is trying to kidnap her at first. Ted will tell Phyllis to sit in the driver's seat because there is no passenger seat, only a driver's seat and a back seat. Ted will go to the front of the car, acting like he is doing something underneath the hood. More than likely, he is taking off his cast and grabbing a weapon to knock Phyllis unconscious. Just a few moments go by, a minute or so. Phyllis jumps out of the Volkswagen and says, sorry, bye, and runs off. Ted will simply wrap up there, knowing that he has just scared someone off, not knowing if she's going to tell the authorities. He leaves, and this is where the next part of the story in the same night continues. The next place Ted will end up that night is at a local drinking tavern, and this is where Ted will run in to Brenda Ball. This is also where many different accounts will be told of what happened that night. What is known is that Brenda is a regular at the bar, just relaxing and enjoying her life. According to witnesses, Brenda was at the bar until closing time, which was 2 a.m., and was asking a few friends that she knew at the bar for a ride home. They simply said they could not. It was not in their direction. This is the last true statement that comes out of the story. The rest is all hearsay, and it goes like this. Supposedly at 2 a.m., witnesses say they saw Brenda outside of the bar talking to a man with a cast. The problem with that story is, is that it comes out weeks later after the newspaper starts talking about a man in a cast talking to women that are disappearing. The other story is that Brenda was inside the bar talking to a man nicely dressed and that she simply went home with him. What we do know is that Brenda just vanished at 2 a.m. from the tavern that night. While Ted was in prison, he talked about the Brenda Ball case in the third person, not saying that he did it, but speculating what the killer may have done. This is what Ted said. Ted said that the killer may have been trying to change his M.O., abducting a woman in a different location. Perhaps the killer ran into Brenda Ball, who was looking for a ride home that night. After picking Brenda up, they became even more friendly and made more small talk. And the killer simply asked, there's a party back at my house, would you like to come? Brenda agreed so. As they were driving back to the killer's house, aka Ted's house, they were still just having normal chit chat and getting along. Maybe the killer did not know what he was going to do. Maybe he was just seeing if he could restrain himself toying with his own self. When they reached the house, Brenda could see that there was no party. She was hesitant to go in, but the killer told her, it's okay, just come inside and we'll have a nice time. When they went inside, they continued drinking until Brenda was extremely intoxicated. At that stage, they had casual intercourse, but the killer was not satisfied. It was not enough for him. He did not fulfill himself so he decided to strangle her while she was sleeping. During this same interview, the interviewer said, but what about the roommates the killer had, AKA Ted had roommates in this house that he lived in? The interviewer said, that seems risky. Ted would say, if you lived with someone, yes, but he had his own place. Ted did have his own place, but we do know Ted had roommates far off in the house, but still had roommates. Ted would have this same situation in Utah, and that would not stop him. He brought many of his victims to his Utah home. It's really hard to say if Ted was telling the truth. When Brenda's skull was found, it had a huge fracture in it, which would seem that someone knocked her over the head with an object. But going into the morning of June 1st, when Ted was supposed to be at the baptism that morning, he did not show up until two hours later and made up some excuse, obviously running late due to spending too much time with the corpse on Taylor Mountain 
or taking Brenda's corpse to Taylor Mountain. Many people believe that Ted was lying when he said he took Brenda to his home, but it's hard to say. Ted told many lies during these interviews, but what we do know is that Brenda's skull was found on the top of Taylor Mountain, even though her head was more than likely kept at his apartment for some time. Just a week and days later, Ted will take a person that will make massive headlines. On June 11th of 74, George Ann Hawkins will vanish in the night. This is the one case that we know too much about. Ted will confess to the kidnapping and murder in details of George Ann Hawkins two days before his execution, using this as a method to buy more time for his own life. It gives detail and insight to the rest of his victims. Ted is back at the University of Washington, the same place where he almost took Phyllis Armstrong just a week before. This time, Ted will park his car in the back alley, right behind Phyllis and George's dorm. He will then get out, walk up the alley with his crutches and a briefcase, and just wait. Wait for someone to walk by and then grab their attention. It's obvious Ted has been watching this place. He knows George Ann and Phyllis live right here. He's been watching them. This will make at least three times Ted has been at this location in a week's time. When Ted is confessing to George Ann Hawkins, he will give another account of a young lady he ran into the same week, saying he was drunk, on crutches, pulling the same trick, but this time, Ted was so drunk that he was confessing his name, where he went to school, where he lived, things about himself. But when he finally made it to his Volkswagen with the young lady, he said, I just didn't have it in me that night. I was tired and just wanted to go home. And the girl simply just walked away and her life was spared. Ted said he was completely paranoid about the situation after he took George Ann, thinking the girl was going to tell the police about a man named Ted driving a Volkswagen who was in law school. Ted would confess that he was completely paranoid that the young girl was going to tell the police that she met a man just days earlier who she helped walk to his Volkswagen in crutches saying his name was Ted and that he went to law school and it was late at night. But a more tragic story would unfold. The story of George Ann. Ted would say it like this. Ted would be waiting in the alley late that night, and as he saw George Ann come down the alley, he would simply act like he was walking on his crutches, drop his briefcase to where George Ann could see him struggling, and ask, could you please help me? I seem to have dropped my briefcase, and I can't bend down to get it. George Ann would pick up the briefcase, walk slowly back to Ted's Volkswagen. When they arrived at the Volkswagen, not far away, George Ann would focus her attention on something else. Ted had asked her. Ted would go around to the front where he had placed a crowbar right beside the tire. He would grab it and knock George Ann unconscious. He then grabs George Ann, puts her in the passenger seat of his Volkswagen, and drives off with her. She's never seen again. This is where the story would take a turn. Once again, Ted claims that he would take George Ann to a different dump site, a fresh one, a new one somewhere he has already scouted out. This new location will be called the Issaquah Dump Site. This will be another famous site because it will hold many mysteries and new victims. Ted says that while he is driving George Ann to this new site, she comes to, she starts talking about a Spanish test. She's out of it. Ted will almost make it seem like she is calm, but with common sense, one can assume that George Ann is upset and she's aware that something is wrong. Ted says when they reach the destination, he knocks her unconscious again and strangles her to death. Ted does not go into detail at that moment for the next part. He simply fast forwards to the next day. Ted said when he got up the next day, he went back to the site and looked over everything to see if he had left anything and of course, to spend more time with the body. Ted said he had thought he had left George Ann tied up with his rope and he wanted his rope back. But to his surprise, he had untied her that night. But Ted does find a new problem. One of George Ann's shoes are missing. So Ted went back home, parked his Volkswagen, got on his bike, and around five o'clock that afternoon, he would arrive back at the crime scene. 
Ted said the place was swarming with police, but Ted knew exactly where he was parked and right where he hit George Ann. He said he simply parked his bike, walked over, found George Ann's shoe and her two earrings and took them and simply rode off. Ted will then give more detail, gruesome detail, in the George Ann's disappearance. He's talking with Kepler. Kepler's been looking for George Ann for 15 years with no luck of finding her. Ted will say he buried her at the Issaquah site on a rocky hillside, but he said, you won't find her head there. Ted said George Ann's head was buried in a different location, further up from her body. Ted would even draw a map to the best of his memory, trying to help Kessler believe in him and help in the finding of George Ann's skull. Kepler pushed the interview to get more out of Ted, and Ted would say this. Ted said about the third day, he went back and used the hacksaw to remove George Ann's head. Ted would then veer the conversation somewhere else, but it's obvious Ted wanted it and took it with him for some time. Ted said one more disturbing thing about George Ann. Ted said if you did find the head, you would probably find damage to the head, the jaw in particular, probably broken. But if you'd found it, you'd have known who it was. Till this day, nothing has ever been found of George Ann. Now that Ted has a new dumping site called the Issaquah site, it happens to be close to a particular place called Lake Sammamish Park. At this point, Ted is not going back to Taylor Mountain. He's piled up too much evidence and the bodies that are there are very decomposed because at this point, it's in July. On July 14th, 1974, Ted would find his last two victims on a hot sunny day, Lake Sammamish Park. After these two victims, Ted would have to skip town due to so much attention on the case. The story would start with a 23-year-old woman named Janet Ott around noon that day. Her husband was out of town and it was a nice day. She was by herself and she just wanted to go to the beach and relax. So she took her bike and left her apartment. She left her roommate a note saying she should be back around 4.30, but she never would return home. Once Janet had arrived at the lake, she found a place and sat down. Not long after settling down, a man would walk up on her that obviously saw that she just got there. It was Ted. He introduced himself as Ted. He's saying that his arm is hurt and that his parents live up the road and he wants to get his catamaran out and go sailing. A witness will say that Janet is not really wanting to go and trying to be polite and saying no. But Ted will keep staring in the conversation to them both leaving, hesitant and not wanting to. Janet will stand up, collect her belongings, and walk away with Ted. As she's walking, the witness will hear her say, I've got to get my bike. Can we bring it? Ted will say, sure thing. It'll fit right on the back of my car. Janet will never be seen again. Neither will the bike. It's never found. As Janet remains missing, no one even knows she's gone most of the day. Her husband's out of town, and she was there alone. Her husband will eventually come home heartbroken, looking for her, putting up flyers everywhere. It's just another sad part of the story. Four hours later, Ted will return to the beach. It's obvious he's not looking for evidence. He's taken Janet to the Issaquah site and left her there. He's returning now to find someone else. Ted will stumble upon Denise Naslin. Denise is there with a group of people, including her boyfriend, but at one moment, she will get up to go to the restroom, and while she's walking there, or coming out of the restroom, she will walk right into a conversation with Ted. Ted is giving her the same speech, more than likely, saying he's got a hurt arm, his parents have a catamaran, he wants to go sailing, he needs help. No one really knows what's possessed these two women to go with a stranger, other than Ted is sharp looking, he speaks well, he doesn't fit the profile of a maniac. It seems safe. Ted never really opens up about the case, but there is something that did happen while Ted was in prison. Supposedly, Ted did talk to somebody, somebody that he looked to as equal, who is and was a notorious serial killer, Gerard Schaefer. Schaefer was a serial killer around Florida in the early 70s. Gerard was into a lot of the same things Ted was. 
necrophilia, death, bodies. But Gerard was into something else, too. He was into elements of torture that involved dismemberment while alive. The two would have conversations, supposedly, while in prison. Gerard said that Ted told him about two girls he had taken at a lake, saying he took them the same day and murdered them, saying he went back for days, assaulting their bodies and taking their heads. Janet and Denise's bodies will only be found in skeleton form months later at the Issaquah site. But as Ted ends up in Utah, doing the exact same thing he did in Washington. He's living in a new house, calling himself a law student, and still abducting women. Ted will go on to take the lives of at least 15 more women, confirmed, and many more suspected, that have never been identified, or known about, or confirmed. Ted will soon tell his girlfriend Liz he will be going to Utah to study law. It's all rouge. Ted knows he needs to get out of the state. No one still suspects that Ted has anything to do with this. Even authorities. But one person does. It's Liz, Ted's girlfriend. She says there's just too many coincidences. A man driving a Volkswagen. Fluffy, black hair. His name is Ted. Athletic looking. The next time Ted returns to Washington, he will be a key suspect in over 20 murders that are known about and disappearances of women, and even move in with Liz and her daughter. Ted's two dumping sites, the Issaquah and Taylor Mountain, will be found months later and searched. The Taylor Mountain search will find Ted's first four victims. By this time, not much will be found on the site. Skulls, a few bones, and some clothing, and mounds of hair from a few of the victims that has stayed preserved all this time. The Issaquah site, only two victims will be found and identified, but four vertebrae will be found. One to Janet and one to Denise. The other one was thought to be George Ann Hopkins, but it's never proven. The last one was never identified and Ted never gave any other clues to who it could be. By the time the authorities returned to the Issaquah site, looking for George Ann because of Bundy's last interview saying he buried George Ann there. Much digging and unearthing the location will happen, but nothing will be found of George Ann. Talking about all these young women that were beautiful, they were smart, intelligent people that were going to make a difference in society and make a family and they were taken by someone with no value of life. They lived beautiful lives and were beautiful people. And it's sad that someone that shouldn't even be called a human would take them away from everyone just to fulfill a need and go on to the next one. Friends, thank you so much for listening. If you learned anything from this video, remember, be careful who you take rides from and who says, they're in need of help.